Okay, so uh, so I, uh, this is not a traditional approach I'm going to take. It's not, uh, you know, where I'm going to be showing a whole bunch of theory and equations and, you know, walking through a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo. This is, I'm going to use an experimental approach. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a principle about op amps and then I will, you know, look at the date, a data sheet parameters and then I'll take that and we'll take a look at it in L LT space. What's wrong with mumbo jumbo? <laughs> I, I could do that too, but I don't think anyone is going to appreciate that. <laughs> so, you know, and so me and the fonts here, I'm going to use the fonts to, to point out where I'm on base and where I'm going off base. So anytime you see a picture of the fonts, it means I'm stating something uh, factual and where I'm kind of veering off fact, factual, uh, the fonts is going to pull, pull me back and keep me on the straight and narrow. So some basic fundamentals about op amps is just a bunch of transistors. I, who cares? You could go through and check it out and do calculations, figure it out. Uh, for the time being, we're just going to treat it as a black box. Okay, and an op amp has two inputs, output, and it's got uh, power supplies. So there's a inverting input, which is marked as a minus. There's a non-inverting input that's marked as a plus. Okay, and then you've typically you've got a positive voltage power supply source and a negative voltage uh, supply source. And you know, I'll be referring to them as rails. And I think in when you're talking about op amps, you'll you'll hear you know uh, uh, you'll see a rail to rail op amp or you know, it's going to swing to the positive rail. It's going to swing to the to the negative rail. So the rail just means it's a positive. It's the positive uh, bus. I think rail comes from the fact that circuits used to have like a positive bus and a negative bus, and that would be a rail or something like that, right? So the basic principle of an op amp is very simple. Okay, the only thing you you got to know is when both inputs are, are, are equal, the output is zero. When both inputs are equal, you got three volts, three volts, the output is going to be zero volts. The minute you get a difference, okay, the voltage is going to swing towards one of the rails. Okay, so principle one, it's, uh, let's talk about this input offset voltage. So if you have a, a positive input at the input, like your positive input is greater than the negative input, so your non-inverting input is greater than your uh, inverting imp, imp, input, the output will swing to the positive rail. There's no linearity. The minute the positive input is bigger than the negative input, uh, that is the uh, uh, the non-inverting and inverting input. Okay. Once the positive side is bigger, it's going to swing to the positive rail, and vice versa. If the negative input is greater than the positive in input, it's going to swing to the negative rail. Okay. Now in real op amps. The um, there is an um, due to manufacturing. If you apply a zero voltage to, or you apply the same voltage to both of the pins, you will get some small output coming out, and that's because the, the transistors are not identically matched in the op amp, and um, it's and. They'll show this in the data sheet. They'll show the input offset volt, voltage. That's typically, you know, between 40 microvolts to 150 microvolts. So typically, even though your your inputs are matched, you may measure a voltage output of that order of magnitude. For me, and this is where the fonts is going to slap my hands. For me, 
I typically say that, you know, what's the offset needed between the plus and minus to make it hit a rail? Okay, now that is not input offset voltage. Let me be clear about that. But in my mind, I think that's what input offset voltage is. Okay, so in this talk, I'll be using the LT1013. Okay, in LT Spice because that's a native model and it's basically the replacement of the LM358. So it's a little bit better. It's got a little bit higher performance than an LM358, but you're going to get pretty much the same char characteristics between the two. So any, any uh, circuit modeling I do where I use a, a LT1013 amp, uh, it'll be basically the same as LM358. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, I do. Yeah, what? Do you, do you actually have uh, an LT1013 on hand? It's, it comes with the package. No, 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 I don't mean an LT Spice. I mean, do you have a real a real LT1013 chip? I don't, I don't think so. This is this is low bandwidth. These are okay. these, these are op, op amps are not, I don't know, they're more audio, even even audio. I don't know if they're they're that great because they're very bandwidth limited, right? And they're the noise in them, noise floor and all that stuff. But we'll talk about noise later on. Okay, so here's my first experiment. So let's take a look at the input offset voltage. So in this amplifier, I introduce some gain and I only introduce gain so we can get a measurable output here. And I'll explain to you how we get gain in a subsequent slide. But for the time being, ignore the feedback net network and just look at it. it's a op amp and I've got an input. I've got my uh, one input grounded and I've got the other one I'm feeding at zero volts. Okay. So can you guys see that okay? Is that yeah. clear? Yeah. Okay. okay. So if I do that and I measure the output voltage, I'm getting the output voltage is 1.2 millivolts. So it's kind of interesting. So so with with both pins at the same voltage, okay, I'm getting a 1.2 millivolt output. So so I ask I ask myself, okay, I've got a gain of about 100 here. What input do I need to set this voltage at to get zero? And so I do a little bit of math. My gain's 100, right? And I, you know, I divide 1.2, what I measure here, by 100, and I get 12 microvolts. So I put, I experiment a little bit, and it turns out that if I put minus 12, 0156 microvolts, I get 11 femtovolts coming out. Do you guys know how big a femtovolt is? Okay. As, a, heard. as an order of magnitude, a femtometer, a femtometer, okay, is the size of a nucleus. You're getting down to a nuclear measurement of, a, of an actual proton. I think a, a, a proton is one femtometer. Right, so this is this is pretty much zero volts. <laughs> it's 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 uh, far beyond what we could even possibly measure. So in this in this simulation here, we need an, uh, the input offset is twelve microvolts to make the output zero. But in the data sheet, it's saying forty to one fifty. There is later on. I'll talk. Uh, there is a. Um, Dave Jones has a video where he talks about why you could almost never get uh, these parameters. You will get these uh, parameters here. And he's got a video explaining that um, uh, you could go and if you want to understand why, you could go look look at it. But uh, I don't think in a, um, in a measurement, we'll actually measure that. Okay, so, and also keep in mind this, they're saying this is due to manufacturing. This is also a theoretical calculation, right? So it's based on theory and uh, 
this is based on what the manufacturing comes out with. Okay, any question about input offset voltage? It's pretty straightforward. So, okay, so now let's talk about what the offset voltage is. So now I'm, this is where I'm straying. Okay, so if I have one microvolt, one microvolt, and I feed it in, uh, I'll get, here I'm, I'm seeing 1,000 nanovolts and I've got no feedback. I'm seeing one microvolt here, right? Before we were seeing millivolts, right? We're seeing one microvolt here. Okay, so now the, the, the sheet says 40 uh, microvolts is what you need uh, between uh, the two to make it zero. So I thought, okay, let me set this to, to a, a, a difference of 40 microvolts and I put that in and I measured the output. And if you look at the, the output, okay, um, I'm seeing 13, uh, almost 14 volts, and I've got a 15 volt rail, 15 minus 15 volt rails. I'm seeing 14 volts on the output here. Now, if I take a look at that, it's a 40 millivolt difference going in, and I've got 14 volts coming out. That's 350K, 350,000, a gain of 350,000 or 615 dB of gain. It's huge. Now, if you look at the data sheet, they say the large signal voltage gain is around 8 volts per microvolt, which is about 8 million. So with, with an op amp, you get absolutely huge gains, right? So now remember I'd said, well, if the difference, you've got a big enough difference, it should swing and hit. The output swings to one of the uh, voltage rails. So in this case, the positive input is larger, so it should swing to the positive rail 15 volts. But we're seeing 14 volts. It's like, huh? What the heck's going on here? So for homework, uh, if you guys are in interested, take a look at this, build this circuit up, and try varying this voltage from zero to 40 microvolts and just see what the gain is. Play around with it and see what you get as an output. Okay, let me zoom back out here. Okay. Dave, so Dave can you post can you post the uh, LT space the presentation for us then somewhere? Sure. sure. Yep. Okay. Yep. So so this is now I'm now getting so that last slide I'm kind of getting into my view of offset. So here now is um, I'm getting more deeper into my view of an offset. So in this case, I'm going to set my non-inverting input to a pulse function. And I've got a slide, a subsequent slide, where I'll talk about the pulse function in LT Spice. But I'm doing a pulse, and that pulse, I'm ramping it up from 0 to 200 microvolts, and I'm ramping it up over... Uh, what is it, 300 uh, milliseconds. So I'm doing that ramp over 300 milliseconds, but I don't know why I did that. And then I, you know, it's only, I needed to go look at 75 microvolts. So I didn't need to ramp it up that big, but so I'm only showing the voltage input going up to um, uh, 75 microvolts, which is, 150 uh, milliseconds. So if you were to probe the V in here, this is what this pulse is doing. It's just doing a ramp. It's a ramp function. It's doing a pulse. It's ramping up the voltage here. So in this chart now, I'm looking at the output here over time. Okay. And I cut it off over 150 milliseconds. Right here's my it's my transient analysis is over 150 milliseconds, and if you look at my V in, my V in is microvolts, so it's going to be down here flat. So I exaggerated it 
and I just drew a dotted line here just to exaggerate it so you can, so if you pretend this scale is in microvolts and this scale is in volts, so this line will pretend that that's at 75 microvolts here, okay? And that's what this is, I'm just taking that line, overlaid it here. So now let's look at it, what voltage does it max out here? So when does it hit 14 volts? And as it turns out, it's at 46 microvolts. So at 46 microvolts, right, the op amp hits the, the top here. It, it, uh, it cuts off at 14 volts, okay? So that means at 46 microvolts, that's my kind of my offset voltage. So I know that once I have about 46 microvolt difference between the two inputs, I'm going to hit a, um, a rail. I'm going to hit the, the maximum volt voltage. So that's what I kind of look at as the uh, input offset. And it turns out it's the same as what's seen here. I think it's just coincidence, frankly, because uh, again, this is something totally different than this. Okay, so, but it's still not hitting the rail. It's still not hitting 15 volts. It's only capping out at 14 volts. Okay, so, so let's have an LT spice minute. So this is the pulse function. When you go into your source and you right click on your source and you define your source, you could go in and you could set up a sine wave and a pulse width uh, modulation. But if you select the pulse, the pulse is the function I probably use the most in in L, LT Spice. So the way it works is you've got an initial voltage of zero. So you can see here the initial voltage is zero when it starts out. Uh, it's going to ramp up to five volts. So the maximum is going to be five volts. I'm going to delay turning on the pulse for 100 microseconds. And you'll see here there's a tiny gap between the axis and when the line starts going up. Can you guys all see that, okay? So yeah. I've, I've, I've delayed yeah. the pulse. So I've got my T rise, T fall, T on. So T rise is the time you're gonna, it's gonna ramp up to five volts. I've set it to five milliseconds. My falling time, the time it's gonna fall, it's five uh, milliseconds, five milliseconds and the time it's going to stay on is five milliseconds. So, so the Dave, whole period Dave, here is 15 milliseconds. Yeah. Why did you pick, why did you um, do that delay? Why not start it at zero? I just, I just wanted to show you guys what that delay means. Oh, okay. It's not, it's not that you wanted to do it in the simulation. Okay. No, I just want to show you guys what okay, that delay enough. does. That's all. Yeah. So, as I said, this is one of the, most useful things, a lot of times, I will set my rise time to one pico second. Do you know why? Why would I use one pico second? Because you want to rise fast. Yeah, I want, a a sharp, I want a sharp brick wall pulse. I want a brick wall, I want a sharp pulse coming up because I want to, it's like I'm hitting it with an impulse function and I want to see what, what the circuit is going to do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's another thing I do all the time. So this is where now we come to this thing called rail-to-rail. -rail. In this end, now what's missing here in the data sheet there, this, is, this parameter is valid for a input voltage of plus or minus 15 volts. That's why I picked plus or minus 15 volts for my uh, op amp, right? is because most of the data sheet parameters are around plus or minus 15 volts. So it's telling me in the data sheet, the maximum voltage sway I'm going to get is 14 volts. It, this op amp cannot swing to the positive or negative rail. Okay, this will bite you in the ass, especially when you're using small voltages. You're feeding, you're feeding your op amp with like five volts, and all of a sudden, the the um, uh, the usable 
width of it is limited. You're only getting up to four volts. And it's like, why the heck can't I get, why, why the heck is this op amp clip, clipping at four volts? That's why. Okay, op amps that swing to both rails are called rail-to-rail -rail op amps. Okay, so, so far, what's our findings? Op amps have a huge gain, huge gain. And a small input voltage, we saw around 40, 40 ish microvolts difference being fed into the op amp is going to create a huge gain coming out. Okay, so let's use the pulse now and let's take a look at this as a comparator. Let's look at as a, using an op amp as a comparator. So in this situation, if the voltage is below a reference voltage, or if, if a voltage exceeds a reference voltage, I want a signal on my output to tell me that I've exceeded a, a reference voltage. So that's what a comparator is doing. You're comparing two voltages. So the, with this way, the way this works, my reference voltage here is 3.3 volts. I'm feeding it with a pulse function. And it's going from zero to five volts. Here's my pulse, the blue, which is V in. Here's my blue, it's going from zero to five. There's no delay, right? Uh, and it's, oh no, I do have a delay of 500 microseconds. And so it's gonna rise, it's gonna rise for 250 microseconds. It's gonna stay on for 250 microseconds and it's gonna drop for 250 microseconds. Oh, and by the way, I didn't uh, talk about the cycles and period. So here cycles is the last parameter. So if you just wanted one pulse, you could just put one here. If you wanted to get it, this thing repeating over the period you specify here, you put in zero and it's gonna repeat, the pulse is just gonna keep repeating. If you just want two pulses, you could put two pulses in. So in this case, I've got it set to a zero, so it's gonna repeat, but I'm only, my um, transient is only going to, what's that, two milliseconds? Yeah, I'm going up to two milliseconds, right? So that's my a voltage is going up. So when this cross is 3.3 volts, we're gonna see the output swing. So you can see the output here. Initially it's plus 14 volts, which is the maximum voltage it can hit. And then at some point it swings down, hits the negative rail. I'll, I'll just call it the negative rail, which is not really a negative rail. It's 14 volts, minus 14 volts. And then once that ramp, that uh, pulse, comes back down and crosses 3.3, it ramps up. And so here, if I do a cursor and I measure what my input voltage is here, just when this circuit starts dropping, you'll see that it's 3.3 volts. Same thing here. If I measure the voltage here, you'll see it's 3.3. So this 1.65 is this voltage here. And this, uh, at 582 microseconds, that's this voltage here. Makes sense, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so let's go on to, to principle number two. Let's talk about bias currents. So an ideal op, op amp has infinite input impedance. Input impedance. Peter, this is where you should light up, okay? An ideal op amp has an infinite input impedance. So that means no current should flow at the inputs. However, it's not ideal, it's got transistors and there's a tiny bit of current that flows in, that's called the input bias current. And if you look here, it says that it's about 12 to 20 nanoamps is gonna slip, slip through. Peter, you should light up here because all of a sudden this means that you could potentially use an op amp for an active probe, because it's got a huge input impedance. If you look at the input impedance, it's 400 mega ohms. 400 mega ohms is your input impedance. That's why you got such a tiny amount of current flowing in. 
So there's a differential input impedance and a common mode. Differential just means the voltage between the uh, plus and minus pins are relative to each other. It's a differential voltage. The voltage is relative to each other. Common mode means the voltage is relative to ground. So you're measuring the voltage of this relative to ground and the voltage of that relative to ground. I don't know, I'm sure Hassan could probably tell us an application for common mode I don't, or someone else. I don't know of any applications for common modes. The FONS is saying that typically we're using it in differential mode. Oh, well, the common mode voltage. If you're measuring current on a high voltage rail, you, that, like for example, um, yeah, you got you got your car battery, zero, your ground is at zero volts, the other one's at 12 volts. You want to measure the current through it on the 12 volts rail. Well, you hook up your op amp to it. So then there's a common mode voltage of 12 volts, and then there's a, oh, and you, there's a differential voltage across a sense resistor proportional to your current. So that's when this matters. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because then the uh, the voltage sense a resistor, it's so tiny because it's like 0.1 ohms, and the voltage difference across that's going to be so small, you can measure that. The uh, the op amps will pick it up, right? Right. That's yeah. right. So you want to amplify that tiny voltage across your like. 0.1 ohm resistor. So for one amp, you'll have 0.1 volts. But the, th the problem is then there's a 0.1 volt between plus and minus of the op amp, but then they're both at 12 volts. So that's the issue. So it's right. like 12.1 on the first and 12.0 on the other. Right, but you still get a differential voltage across them, right? Right. So some op amps don't perform well, but if, or they actually let the 12, the common mode signal bleed into the output so that, that you know and that's and that's where that they have that common mode rejection ratio right right so they should drop it down by a million or something if it's 60 db then the 12 volts becomes 12 microvolts and yeah okay so so now let's do a little experiment here this is my next experiment let's measure this current and see what the current is okay so here I've got two resistors connected. It's got nothing to do with feedback, but probably it's going to impact the um, the uh, op amp, the the amplification, right? And so I've got two sources. One is set for one volt. One is set to ten volts. I wanted to make it really stiff between the two, right? A very stiff difference between the two. And this is just a current sense resistors. And so let's take a look at the current. So the current in R2 is 9.6 nanoamps, and the current through R3 is uh, minus 32 nanoamps. Again, nanoamps, really small current. We're seeing flowing into it. And according to the data sheet, we should be seeing between 12 and 20 nanoamps going in, right? So the nice thing about this principle that uh, no current, essentially very little current flows into an op amp. That makes the math in terms of analyzing op amps trivial because no, no current, negligible current is flowing into the op amp. Most of the current is flowing into the feedback network. So if, if you look at derivation, derivation of gain and analysis of the feedback network, the math becomes trivial. It's easy to go and do. We're not going to do the math. Don't worry. We're not doing the math here. We're using experiments. So uh, what about the output current? I'm glad you asked. Let's measure the current the output current. So I just put a small current sense resistor here. You know, usually use a small resistor for current sense. So um, let's feed in you know, 3.3. This is called a um, voltage follower. I'll come back to this. We'll talk about this, but for the time being, ignore it. Let's just look at the current that's uh, feeding into the amp and the current that's coming out of the amp. So what's feeding into the amp is four nanoamps, 
what's coming out of the um, op amp, it's 28 milliamps. Look at the gain. So that's why this configuration is called a buffer amp. Because this thing, and again, Peter, you should light up here, because this is the this is the way a active probe works. You you you're sampling a tiny little bit of current and you're producing an output here that you can attach to your scope and measure it. Right? And this won't influence the circuit you're you're measuring because it's only drawing a tiny, tiny little bit of current. Right? So a finding here is these op amps have a huge current gain. Okay, so now output impedance. So th this is a weird thing. I, you read everywhere and everyone says, oh, op amps have a low out output impedance, but it's not specified in the data sheets. You, I couldn't find it. I searched a bunch of data sheets to try and get the uh, output impedance, but I couldn't see it. But I know that a lot of sources will come back and say, normally it's low and usually it's resistive. And that's why you'll see a lot of um, op amps in, in the data sheets. It'll say capable of driving, you know, capacitive loads or complex loads. That's why, because if it's a purely resistive output, I think if you put a complex capacitive load, it might do funky things to the um, op amp itself. I don't know, that's above my uh, pay grade. But um, so what I did was I did a little experiment here because if it's purely resistive, I put a stiff difference between the two inputs and now I look at what my output is. I know it's going to hit 14 volts, right? So I now say, okay, what resistor do I need to put here to make it half? And this will be my input, my output impedance. So it turns out it's 250 ohms. I get 7.02 volts on the output. So it looks as if uh, the LT1013 in this configuration its output impedance is 250 ohms, which is in low, which is low. Okay, so now let's talk about the most interesting thing about op amps is the negative feedback. Okay, so the principle here is very, very simple. This is so simple. Okay, so remember we said that if the positive input is greater than the negative input, the output is gonna hit the rail. It's gonna slam into this rail. It's just gonna go whoop right up to this rail. And there's gonna be a ramp function in terms of how quickly it could do that. We'll talk about that later on. That's called slew rate, okay? So it's gonna be a certain amount of time. It's gonna ramp up to hit that rail, but let's just assume it's instantaneous. So the minute this thing, this uh, input, is higher than this input by about 40 microvolts, whoop, this thing goes up and hits this uh, rail, okay? So same thing happens on the negative side, or, or if, if the positive side is below the negative rail, uh, or negative input, if the positive input drops below the negative input, then it's going to slam in, into the negative rail. This thing's going to go whoop. It's going to go right down to the negative rail. There's no linearity. It just goes right down. And actually, we didn't. I didn't mention about linearity because if you look at where is that experiment where I uh, where was that experiment? Uh, yeah, here. Okay, so this is the output here coming out, and this is a linear input. If you look, the output is not linear when it hits the rail. So op amp is not a very good linear device without a feedback network. Look at that, it's it's like a uh, X squared term, right? Or it's a, uh, 
a parabolic function, right? It's not very linear. So now where was I? Yeah, so it's here. So so in all S, so that's why I'm saying this thing just goes whoop, whoop, and it hits the rail. You could actually hear the op amp making that noise. You'll hear it going whoop. So we could use that to our advantage. So if this voltage is bigger than this voltage, this voltage starts to go up and as we feed it back here and as soon as it hits itself, it's gonna shut off to zero, right? It's Or it's not gonna shut off to zero, it's gonna drop back down. And it's gonna go through this cycle where it's gonna keep doing that and it locks onto that output voltage because the output voltage, if I feed in 3.3 .3 volts here, output has to be 3.3 .3 volts to feed back here to make it zero, to make these match, right? So that's what negative feedback is doing. You're feeding back some of the signal to one of the inputs to control how the output is gonna look. Okay, that's that's the most important concept about a, a, a amp, and this is for a gain of one. This has a gain of one. This is called a buffer, or it's called a voltage follower. Okay, so here's a voltage follower. Here's my example where I'm feeding it back. I'm feeding in 3.3 volts. Okay, and I look at the output, and I get 3.2999 volts, and a difference of getting about 476 nanovolts difference between the input and the output. So if I look at probe my input, probe my output, I'm seeing a difference of 476 uh, nanovolts, okay? So this difference is pretty small, okay? You'll see in subsequent slides, the, the bigger this difference is. So if, we, if I was to make this 12 volts here, okay? this voltage here would be bigger, okay? And Dave Jones talks about, about that and why you shouldn't have your op amps operating near your rails. So in this, in this application here, you want the op amp to be operating around zero volts. So 3.3 .3 volts around zero volts is excellent. You're gonna get the best performance for the amp. So, you want to stay away from the rails. You, you don't want your, your input functions to be near the rails, your, your input voltage to be near the rails because that will cause a bigger difference here. And I'll, you'll see that in a subsequent slide I've got. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, the input offset should be 40 microvolts, right? So we're not seeing anywhere near that. And, but Dave Jones talks about that. He's got a uh, a talk where he talks about why you you won't necessarily see some of these uh, data sheet parameters. So let's do the same thing now for an AC signal. So here I'm going to now introduce a a one kilohertz signal going from zero to five volts. Okay, and let's look at how that looks here. So here's my input, here's my output. Uh, you know, it's uh, right where I did the uh, cursor, I'm measuring 4.9 volts, okay? And if you look at the difference, I'm seeing 1.5 uh, millivolts difference. I'm seeing a bigger offset than what I saw for a, a bigger difference from uh, what I saw, right? So. It's not a rail issue because we're, we're swinging to five volts, so we're away from the rail, but it's, it's larger and is, is this coming from the slew rate? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about slew rate later on. But you see, we're, we're seeing a fairly significant amount of difference between the input and the output. So if you guys wanna experiment with this, create a voltage follower, do the same configuration, but try changing the frequency and see what happens. T 
take it up to 20 kilohertz and see what happens. Okay, and it has a hint, it has something to do with the gain bandwidth with product or the slew rate. Okay, so gain and negative feedback. So the way negative feedback, there are two, two configurations that most of the time you're gonna be dealing with is there's the inverting amplifier and the non-inverting amp amplifier. Inverting amplifier, the output is inverted. So you have a plus voltage here, the output is gonna be minus. In a non-inverting in, uh, amplifier, you've got a plus here, you're gonna get a plus coming out, okay? And you could do the math here, it's very simple, and you'll arrive at the gain is just the ratio of these two voltages, uh, of these two resistors, and the gain here is just, again, a dependent on the ratio of these two uh, resistors here with one added in. That's the, ol the only difference. And the way that this works is very simple to understand this. These resistor networks are basically a voltage divider. So you're feeding back a fraction of the output voltage back here. So let's just say you're feeding back half the voltage here, or in, in this case, this, this would be simpler to visualize. So let's just say this feedback network here is you're only feeding back half the voltage coming in. So if you're feeding in two volts here, okay, and you have two volts coming out here, you're only feeding back one volt. So which means this has to be four volts. This has to be four volts to get two volts back here to match this, hence a gain of two. Make sense? Okay, so you use a voltage divider to feed a fraction of the voltage back. And uh, one of the key things you have to know about using resistors here is they introduce noise. So choose values wisely and as well, some of the data sheets, they will provide you with resistors. They'll say for a gain of 10, use this and use, the, use those values specified. I've tried deviating from them and the op amp doesn't perform the way there's a reason why they say, say use specific resistor values. Okay, I think Peter's got a question. Sure. I think you just answered it, but just, just to clarify, <clears throat> so when you're selecting resistors for a, for with considering that, uh, keeping in mind the noise, it is the value of the resistors that contribute to the noise and not the type? Yes, we'll come to that. Okay. I've got a slide where where we'll talk about noise. I, by the way, guys, I have a lot of slides here, and I'm hoping that we could end this quickly and we could get into conversations. If we can't get through it, we, we can't get through it. I just, it's me, I just got too much stuff into this presentation. Okay, so it's really simple. This, these two configurations, this is the majority of times you're gonna be using your amp. So let's take a look at an inverting amp. Here's the case. So I've got a 100K resistor here, 1K. We look at the gain, minus R2 over R1, 100, 1K, it's, it's 100. So we should get a gain of 100. So if we feed in 10 millivolts here, We've got a gain of 100, we should get one volt coming out. And sure enough, here it is, we get uh, uh, minus one volt coming out. Now keep in mind, this is an inverting amplifier, positive voltage in, negative voltage coming out. Okay, now the wise should look at this, the, the observant should look at that and go, huh, Dave, WTF? What is that? Well, this I'm measuring the gain. I'm actually measuring, I'm taking the, the output voltage, dividing it by the input voltage, and I'm getting 100. Gain of minus 100, which is what the equation says. Minus, you get a minus gain, right? And sure enough, we're seeing minus 100 gain, right? And I'll show you about form, form formulas in a second, okay? so. If you want to experiment a little bit, play around with this, change the input volt, voltage and see at what point this thing is going to hit the rail. It's going to clip. 
And I'm sure you could easily calculate that. 14 volts divided by 100 is 1.4 volts. So chances are if you put around 1.4 volts here, this thing is going to hit the rail, right? So you could play around with that and see what happens. Change R2 and R3. See what's, what's the maximum gain you can get. Keep 10, 10 millivolts coming in and maybe change this to a mega ohm or change this to one ohm and play around with it just to see, you know, what happens. Key thing is experiment. Next thing, put a small AC signal here and see what happens to the gain. Put in like a, just as we did with the voltage follower, put in a 10 millivolt uh, sign at peak-to-peak uh, -peak sine wave at, uh, at a kilohertz and see what happens. And see what happens when you measure the gain here, like this. Okay, so look, uh, I think uh, Mike Michael had his hand up there. Yeah, Dave, on slide 19, where the um, can you go back one? The uh, the formula you got there does that come out of LT Spice itself? Is that yep. part of the plotting? Nope, I'll show you. That's my is next. This, is this this is a formula you put in, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is my next slide. So let's take an LT Spice minute and let's talk about trace calculations. So what you would do, you would right click on the trace on the on the uh, graphic window you right click and this window pops up and you say add a trace you could say control a and this window pops up here mm -hmm. and this is where you type in your math you would put v in or v out you would click on v out it would appear here you would put a slash and then you click on v in and and it would come out and say v in slash v out you say okay it plots it that's it and it shows up on the it shows up on the plot. Yes. You, you, okay. You, automatically. Okay. You could say V in times five, V in star five. You could say V in divided by two. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's math. It's like a calculator. Okay. So it turns out that there's a whole bunch of functions you can go and use. I just clipped in. I just clip, clipped in a bunch of things here. Here's a, an expression here. Look at that formula there that this, this put in for this calculation here. And it's smart enough, based on that calculation, it'll tell you what the unit of output should be. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So you could do things like you could do Boolean comparisons. You could do greater than, you could do you could do functions. They've got functions apps. I just clipped in just a couple functions, but they've got it's it's pages and pages and pages of functions. Like here, you could see the power function. There's an ABS function. Uh, what's that? LE. I don't know what that uh, that is. But there's a whole bunch of functions you could go use. Very powerful. This is extremely powerful in LT Spice. LE is less than or equal to. Yeah, okay. I think it says, yeah, it doesn't say that. So it's, it's, got, it's doing some kind of Boolean uh, algebra there, right? So now let's look at a non-inverting amplifier. So in this case, we're doing this situation here. Notice my resistors change. I'll talk about that in, in a minute. But here uh, we're doing, you know, uh, 10K divided by 100. Okay, and the gain's coming out to 101. So we should have a gain of 101. So if we feed in 100 um, microvolts, I don't know why did I say, should be 101 volts, should be millivolts, right? Should be for one, 10 millivolts, we should get, yeah, that's a typo, right? That should be 10 millivolts, right? Yes, sir. Right, so yeah, and even here I have 10 millivolts. Yeah, so 10 millivolts times 101 comes out 1.01. And sure enough, the output is 1.01. And if we look to do the math again, we're getting 100.98, which is 100.1. So it's jiving. This, the math is working and, you know, the fonts would be pleased. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so this will 
mess you up. It messed me up. It wasn't until I did this presentation that I figured this out. Okay, when you've got a small signal, you're using small signals, you gotta be careful with this resistor here. Okay, in this case, I used 5K and 10K here. Okay, look at my output. Okay, I'm still getting 600 microvolts peak to peak output, but look at the peak is 180 microvolts and the bottom is minus 420, 420 microvolts. Zero is here. This is shifted to the negative. This was used to mess me up with op amps all the time. Okay, now if you go back here and you look at the current flowing into these resistors, you will see here one resistor, which is, I can't see what that is. That's R2. Here, it's sinking, it's it's pulling a negative volt, a negative um, current. So it's it's it needs more negative current. Okay? Because this resistor is too big, it can't sink the current from ground. It has to sink it from the output. I, I don't know if I'm using the right terminology. I think that's correct, right? It's sinking current. So, so in this case, you have to use a small enough resistor here so it can sink the current. So here in this case, now I change my resistor values for what's that, uh, 200R and 100R. So I'm getting a gain of three, I guess, here in this case. So if I take a look at that now and I apply that, look at the currents now. They're perfectly matched. Minus one microamp, minus one microamp, plus one microamp for both resistors. And the output is nice and symmetric around zero. Okay, so I, th I believe this may be why some of the op amps, they're telling you specific voltages to use for uh, specific resistances to use for specific gains, because it may have to do with how it sources and sinks current. Okay, uh, fellow jester. That might be, oh, it might be me. I think the reason is, Dave, the, the output impedance of your amplifier is is going to be for the non-inverting configuration you've got the output impedance of your amp of your whole amplifier not just the op amp the whole thing is going to be 10k plus 5k 15k so you have a high impedance amplifier driving a low impedance load so that might be the issue yeah yeah could, could be now the the reason why no one asked this question why did i pick 2k because most of the, most of the data sheet parameters say have a load of 2K. So that's why a lot of my circuits have got a load of a 2K resistor. Or I may have a 1.5K or a 1K because the, the uh, data sheet will say for a 1K load, this is what you expect to happen. So that's why I picked that 2K is because it's, uh, it was part of the data, data sheet parameters. Yeah, but your output impedance should be like a tenth of your, your load impedance. So that's why your bottom one is correct. The top yeah. one is, is too much. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Because this this is actually going to be somehow in parallel with that, right? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Because you, you have to short out the sources. And so this will be in parallel with this, right? because the input impedance is high here. I don't know. I don't know, no. let's figure it out. <clears throat> okay, Kevin was next. Yeah. Oh, I just, Dave, too, the other thing is when you have a higher impedance like that to common, um, the input offset current starts to matter, right? So that you have to worry about that because you're you're working at such low voltage, low voltages and you've got an input offset current it's going to get amplified by the amplifier, right? When you're talking nanoamps like that. Right. So right? You're saying so, so that's if, the other error that's coming into that upper circuit. 
yeah if it's if it doesn't if this is too big you might yeah, not exactly yeah enough, enough current right you don't have enough you the current going through that 5k resistor is not very large relative to the input offset current so that's why down below you've got much more current so the relative right. error is less right and so that's what i was saying here is this has got to be low enough so you could sync the current coming through from yeah there. but it, it, the error is actually the input offset current yeah that, that's where it's coming from yeah as far as i that the, from what i've played around with op amps over the years anyway so this is what, yeah, because I learned this the hard way, and I, I actually did this by by doing this presentation because for the longest time I used high values here resistances, and again you shouldn't use high value res resistances because when we talk about noise, you'll see why. Okay, I think I think Peter had a question too. Yeah, uh, Dave, uh, this whole presentation so far, thank you for this slide. Uh, when I was messing around with this project I'm doing right now, one of the first things I tried was using op amps, and I started to, I spent days and days uh, experimenting with these resistors, and then I started to wonder, well, what's the difference between, say, a 1K to 2K or a 2K to 4K? You know, like, the ratios are the same, but why would I pick one over the other? I had no idea, and I guess you just explained it. Thank you. Yes. So... Let's now look at a single supply, okay? So suppose we wanted to use, before all the op amps we've been looking at has been uh, two rails, minus and a plus rail, right? So suppose we want to use a single supply, okay? Now, these outputs here are not from this circuit. I'm just, I just drew this to show you what a single supply output um, op amp will look, look like. So the negative is grounded and you only have the positive, uh, a voltage supply to the positive. You only got um, a positive voltage, right? So your, your positive rail is 15 volts. Your negative rail is zero, right? the low rail now becomes zero. So your op amp swims, swings between zero and 15. It can't swing between 15 and minus 15. So it's gonna clip at zero, right? So if you take a look at a normal op amp here and let's just say we're, um, you know, it's two supplies. Here's, we got zero. And if you look, we're seeing a voltage swing about three volts, right? Okay, the trick now to doing a, a, a single supply is you have to take this voltage and you have to raise it to half of this voltage to allow it to swing. So here's, here's a, a sample of that. So let's just say 14 volts. Half of 14, well, I use 7.5, 15 volts. So half is 7.5. So you'd have to feed in 7.5 volts here to raise the signal up so that you can get the swing. So it can swing to zero and it can swing to 15 volts. The dynamic range of the op amp now gets restricted. You're only restricted by a voltage um, swing of 15 volts, whereas if you had 15 minus 15, your range is like uh, 30 volts, right? So here you're, you're, you're limited in terms of, I guess, the, the dynamic range of the amp. So now you're still getting three volts you know, swing here, but it's swinging above 7.5 volts. And you're gonna have to use a whole bunch of uh, uh, DC blocking capacitors in this in a single supply configuration. You want, all this stuff in the middle here to be floating at 7.5 volts, but then the outputs, you're gonna put a, a, a DC blocking cap to get it to swing around zero volts. Okay, so here's a little experiment. Here's experiment number 12. So what happens if we don't, forget about this here, what happens if we don't do as I said, and we don't elevate the input to be half of the 
uh, the range here. So all I did in this circuit is I grounded my 15 volts. I shorted it out here, my negative 15 volt supply. I fed it in and I looked at the output. Look at that. It's clipping at zero volts. And in fact, it doesn't even hit zero volts. If you look at the output, it doesn't even get down to, uh, it gets down to 56 millivolts. And again, that might be the fact that it's not a rail to rail amp. So it's not going down to zero volts. And uh, you're swinging up to like one volt here. So you see you're, you're only getting the positive cycle. So here you could get, you could make a really good rectifier here with this amp, right? Who, who, who needs a diode? You could make a little rectifier circuit here with an amplifier. So the way that you do this now is you have to take half the voltage. Here's a voltage divider. I'm taking half of the voltage and I'm feeding it to the other side, to the input. I'm feeding it to the input. So I'm raising the input up 7.5 volts, okay? Uh, I had to put in a DC blocking cap here because I want everything inside here to be floating, right? And I also have to put a short here. I have to put a bypass cap here so that any AC that's coming on this line up to the power supply gets shunted to ground, okay? Very important that you do that. Otherwise, this now is feed, feeding back to your power supply and you'll get lots of noise, okay? So you have to do that. Now, the other thing you have to do, okay, and this also threw me for a loop for a long, long time, you have to put a blocking, a DC blocking cap here because this other inverting input has to float to 7.5 volts. If you short this to ground, okay, you're gonna get a voltage divider here and it's to ground. Whereas if you've got a DC blocking cap here, it's only the AC is going to ground, right? And your the DC is gonna be floating. If you don't have this here, this amp will never work, okay? And sure enough, if we look at it, the amp works. Okay, any questions? But if you have that C2 in there, uh, your voltage source V4, you might as well throw it away. Yeah, well, it, in terms of the uh, simulation, yes, it's, no, it's pointless putting that there. But I put this here as to say in real life, you're going to want to put a blocking cap here because this DC volt will flow back to whatever upstream circuit you've got here and it could impact it. But I don't see how an upstream circuit there uh, with DC is going to ever get through that capacitor. Oh, no, no, no. This capacitor, I, I, let me, I don't think I understand your, your question. Well, it was important to have V4 in there for some reason but you've just taken v4 out no but it's well, a, v4 is a sine wave AC. it's a sine v, wave v4 is a sine wave oh okay i'm sorry yeah okay i see now okay thank you okay yeah no it's an ac signal okay so that's it's blocking dc from coming back because your downstream circuit is going to be have transistors and capacitors and everything and if you're feeding a dc signal to it you could cause problems there, right? So that's why you always put these DC blocking caps between your stages of your amps, right? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so now distortion. Okay, what happens if the gain is too high? So here I've set my input, same configuration here, I've set it to 80 millivolts, okay? My gain is 100, so my output now is 8 volts, so which exceeds the 7.5 volts swing I've got here because I've only got range of 7, seven volts because it's, it's 14 volts, right? So I've only got about 17 volts of headroom here 
seven volts of headroom here, but I need eight volts. So what happens? It hits the rail and it clips. That introduces distortion. So this is what happens if you don't design your uh, single supply op amp and you feed it a signal too high or you've got too much gain. You'll get it clipping and you'll get distortion. So you need enough headroom here in the amp for it to swing, right? Okay, so uh, how are we doing for time? Do you want me to keep going or do you want me to stop? I've got about, I don't know, about 10 more slides left. Well, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, so let's look at some of the limitations. One is a limitation gain bandwidth product. The other one is slew rate and the last is noise. So these are the only three things we're gonna look at and I'm done. So gain bandwidth product, there is a chart on most op, op amps and you'll see a chart like this where it's a plot of gain versus frequency. This is not a broadband amp. The gain falls off with frequency and this is showing you how the gain drops off with frequency. So if you've got a 10 Hertz, um, your, your amplifier is working at 10 Hertz, you're gonna see a gain of upwards of 100 dB maximum. If you go above 100 dB, you're in this range, you get distortion. You wanna be in this side of the curve. This side, the fonds will say this side is good. Thumbs up here bad thumbs down here okay so let's do some experiments here so let's look at this at one kilohertz and 100 kilohertz so we're going to feed in one kilohertz look at the gain look at it where it plots on this chart and we're going to feed in 100 kilohertz get the gain and look at where it plots where it comes out here okay so if we look at this so at uh, one kilohertz now, I could have done the V in divided by V out, or V out divided by V in. Didn't bother. Uh, what I did, I just looked at what the, uh, I took the cursor and I looked at what the voltage is. And uh, so the gain comes out 992 maximum in peak, the peak voltage 992, peak voltage in is 10 uh, millivolts. You're getting a gain of 40 dB. So we look at 40 dB. 40 dB, one kilohertz, we're right there. We're on below the line, we're healthy, we're good. No distortion, signal is nice. We're, we're, we're actually getting 40 dB, thumbs up. Okay, so let's go to 100 kilohertz now. So at 100 kilohertz, we do the same circuit. We look at the peak value, it's 97, 10. We're getting 19.7, we're getting 20 dB of gain. So let's look at 20 dB of gain at 100 kilohertz, whoa, right on the line. And the line is telling us we should only get 20 dB. So we're right at the limit of the gain bandwidth product here. We can't get any higher gain than that, right? So here at one kilohertz, the maximum gain we can get is 60 dB. If we go above 60 dB, not good. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Someone put up their hand, I didn't catch it. Okay, and if you, if you, uh, I think if you go to Dave Jones, not Dave Jones, uh, who's the guy, W2AEW, what's Al? Oh. Al Wolfie. Yeah, he's got a really good video where he talks about gain bandwidth product. So if you want to find out about gain bandwidth uh, product of an amp, he's got a really, really excellent video where he explains it. I should have put a little note for that here. Okay, slew rate. Slew rate will mess you up. Okay, slew rate is something everyone misses. Okay, and slew rate, I've got a little chart where I'll show you what slew rate actually means, but a little experiment. But slew rate is 
it's it's given by this form formula here so it tells you the maximum voltage at a particular frequency you can have so the slew rate is constant here it's 0 0.4 volts for per microsecond right so you can't exceed that that's a that's a voltage frequency product and if you look that's the unit frequency is one over a second the units so the units of frequency of slew rate is volts over over time which is correct so they just give it to in volts over a microsecond to make it a nice small little number so you can't exceed this slew rate your 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 frequency voltage product cannot exceed this number if it does it clips this is what happens so in this case it, you could visualize it like the slope of this line. If you look at the input signal coming up, how fast that in, input signal rises, the slope of it at 10 kilohertz, the slope is less than at 20 kilohertz. The slope is steeper and the amp can't lock on to that slope fast enough. It can't, the output can't adjust to that slope fast enough so you get distortion. Okay, and right here it says that in words. The output of an amp can't change at a certain, uh, certain. it can't change fast enough, right? So is that is that a number that's given in the specification for the yep. op amp? Yep, this is for the LT1013, it has a slew rate. Every op amp I've ever seen has a slew rate. Okay. Okay, it's a fundamental parameter. So this is going to tell you, um, besides uh, bandwidth uh, product, gain bandwidth product, this is limiting how, what frequency and what voltage you can supply to your op, op, op amp. So in terms of what this physically means, let's use a pulse. And here, look, I'm using a one picosecond uh, rise time. See that? I've got it one picosecond rise, one picosecond fall. So I've got a brick wall. I've just got a, I'm slamming this amp with a, with a high, um, uh, with an impulse function. And I'm going to look at the output. How, how does the output perform? Okay. So if you look at the, um, the voltage here, so I just picked an arbitrary V in voltage. I just picked an arbitrary spot. I've just picked an arbitrary voltage here and I chose two millivolts. Okay. Cause that'll be the maximum that uh, I guess this, this rises up to. So I just picked two millivolts and I say, okay, how long does it take for it to hit five volts? So I put my other cursor here to five volts to say, I'm hitting this with a one picosecond pulse. Boom. It's so it's getting a, a, a two millivolt or is it a hundred microvolt, a, a two millivolt, um, signal, right? Uh, voltage and it's getting it instantaneously. So how long is the output? It's going to take the output to come up to five volts. And if you look here, 762 microseconds. That's your rise time. That's what's causing your slew rate. Let's look for it to hit 14 volts from two millivolts. It takes it 2.2 milliseconds. So it takes the amp to ramp up to hit this rail. It takes it two, almost 2.2 uh, uh, milliseconds. If I looked at for one volt, it takes it 150 microseconds. Okay, so this is what your your slew rate is doing. It's 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 a measurement of how long it takes the amplifier to ramp up that output voltage, and that's going to limit how much how fast it, it can feed back to control the amp. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yep. Yep. Okay, so here's a sample slew rate calculation. So slew rate is 0 0.3 volts for per microsecond, which is three 
uh, 300,000 volts per second. Okay, so if you say you wanted 13 volts, what's the maximum frequency you can have? So you go through the calculations, it's 3.6 kilohertz. For one volt, it's 47 kilohertz. For five volts, it's nine kilohertz. Okay, so homework, why don't you test this out? Okay, so let's get into the real rocket science here and now noise. Okay, this is the last section I'm gonna talk about and then I'm gonna shut up. Okay, so as you all know, there is something called signal to noise. There's a signal to noise ratio. So I've got a little picture here showing, um, you know, a noise floor of one, that's just one unit of noise and our signal is four units of whatever it is, volts, millivolts, whatever. So our signal to noise ratio is four to one, simple, right? So let's just say we have a 10, uh, an amplification of 10. So the noise floor gets amplified by 10, comes up to 10. This signal goes up by 10 to 40, but the noise floor does not go up to 10. It goes up by, it's, it gets amplified by 10, but you need to amp it, uh, add in the amplifier noise. This is why we use low noise amplifiers, right? You guys all knew this, right? So our signal to noise ratio is always gonna be less than four because the 10 here is 10 plus the op amp noise, the amp noise. So, and you know, I suspect this has something to do with like uh, thermodynamics entropy or something like that, you can't get, you can't take a signal or Shannon or somebody, Nyquist or someone has a theorem around this that you can't get as good signal to noise by introducing some parameter because that's got to introduce entropy. And so therefore you have to lose something to the signal. I don't, I may not be explaining it correct, but I'm sure the engineers could probably explain it better. Now the amp noise in an op amp comes from two sources. One is the op amp itself, and the other comes from the feedback network. There's a really good video by Dave Jones where he explains this. So op amps have two sources of noise. One is white and one is pink. The pink is, it's called one over F and it's for low frequencies. Okay, and uh, lower frequencies, and the white noise is above the, the mean, the pink noise. And Dave Jones will do a much better job of explaining this than I do. And uh, so typically we, we talk about spectral noise density, and that's why you'll see these noise numbers per root hertz. It's a density. It's a frequency, it's spectral, it's a frequency density. So this, that root hertz has to do with the bandwidth, okay? So it's saying that this op amp has a density of this much noise in nanovolts per root hertz. There's also an input voltage noise and an input current noise. Those both noises are subject to amplification. So you have to take this and whatever gain you've got, you've got to multiply that by the gain and that's what shows up at the output. The other thing is that your feedback network introduces white noise and it's usually the largest component, okay? So the way you model noises in op amps, you've got your current noise and voltage noise apply to the inputs, the input terminals, that gets amplified to the output. You also, the output is gonna get the uh, noise from the resistors, thermal noise from the resistors. And there's a handy dandy way of calculating this for the engineers, you know, and you could work this out and it basically comes out to four nanovolts per root hertz for a 1K resistor. So a 2K resistor, you double that. 10K, you multiply it by 10, so forth. 
and there's a way you could use that. But there's an easier way of doing this in the LT Spice I'm going to show you. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so there's this guy here. His name is Matt Duff. If ever you want to learn about op amps and noise, this is the guy you want to go to. I've been, I've been watching this guy's videos for years now. This guy goes through the nuts and bolts of amps, how they work, how how to do a you know a a a, a, a what's it called a, a maximum voltage amp and you know clippers and all this kind of stuff. He goes through all of them and he explains to them in plain English how they work. So he's got a really good video showing you how to calculate all the noise here from scratch. So I basically duplicated his amp he's got here, same resistors, right? And I applied it to the L LT1023 and I came up with these calculations of noise. This is the spectral noise density, okay? And you take the sum of squares and it comes out to be uh, you know, 2.2 microvolts per root hertz. Now in LT Spice, you could go and do this, or in LT Spice, you could go over to the noise tab and you could let it do the noise calculation for you. And it plots it for you, okay? So once you go here, you tell it the input, the input voltage source, the output voltage, where the output is, the type, it's a decade or it's an octave, the number of points, start and stop frequency. This is going to be your bandwidth for your noise because it's a density. So you're saying calculate it from one hertz all the way up to, uh, uh, what's that, two kilohertz? All the way up to two kilohertz. So that'll be your bandwidth for your amp amplifier. So you click OK, OK, you hit start, comes up, you click here, and it tells you at one kilohertz, your noise density is 2.07 microvolts per root hertz. Bingo. Same as close to that. Look at that. Fonz is happy. Pretty cool, huh? Now, and this one over F noise, you can see if you look at Dave Jones's videos, you'll see here the one over F noise and the white noise, the pink noise, and the white noise over here. If that kind of thing turns you on, go nuts. So now, what does that mean? Okay, we're getting some number here, microvolts per root hertz, but what does that mean for us? What does that mean? This is a noise density, but how do we make this meaningful for us? So the way this is done is that you have to convert that spectral density to an RMS value. And the way you do that in LT Spice, by the way, in any LT Spice trace, you can get the RMS value simply by pointing to the trace pressing the control button and clicking, this box will come up and it'll tell you the RMS value. So here it tells us the RMS value is 154 microvolts. That's our RMS value. Now, if you look at Matt Duff and Dave Jones, they both talk about, you know, how to convert spectral noise into measurement noise. And they both say, just, the easiest way of doing it, multiply it by 6.6. .6. And Fonz is happy because they both say the same thing, multiply it by 6.6. .6. So there now we get our peak to peak noise. For this amplifier here, the amount of noise coming out here, okay, the amplifier is gonna generate one millivolt peak to peak of noise. So now, coming back here, all of a sudden now, we now know this noise. We know it's 10 plus one millivolt peak to peak noise. Okay, that's it, fin.